Hello everyone, welcome back. We're going to do chapter 10 now, the missionary discourse in Matthew's gospel. Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Matthew, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, chapter 10. And he called to him his twelve disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out. And to heal every disease and every infirmity. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, charging them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And preach as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pay, give without pay. Take no gold, nor silver, nor copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay with him until you depart. As you enter the house, salute it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear testimony before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servants like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, utter in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim upon the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's will. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. 
So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. I want to get into the number 12 to begin with. It's very important that we see how this number 12 was deliberately chosen by our Lord in the selection of the apostles that he very specifically and deliberately, intentionally chose 12 uh, to be very important and symbolic. And he made 12, uh, you know, in Matthew it says he called to him his 12 disciples. Right? There's a sense of ownership in Matthew that I like there of these 12 disciples, you know, ownership. And possession, like they are his, they belong to him. We're all supposed to belong to him, BTW. Okay, that's what the church is. All right, the church in English, the word church in English, okay, comes from Kir, comes from Middle English, that ultimately comes all the way traceable back to Greek, Kyriake, uh, literally what belongs to the Kyrios, uh, what belongs to the Lord, Kyriake. That's where we get the word church ultimately when we trace it all the way back. So who are we? We're the ones who are called, St. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, to belong to the Lord. All of us. Uh, that's what the word church means. And they belong to him. He called to him his 12 apostles or disciples here. And in Mark, it says that he made 12 now, that's very important because to make is more than just, you know, appointed, delegated. Uh, he also ordained them, perhaps, perhaps, because the word in Greek, poiein, Pope Benedict XVI points out in Jesus of Nazareth uh, that that very same word is used in the Old Testament Greek translation, the Septuagint. In a couple instances, he cites 1 Kings 12.31 in 1 Kings 13, 33, where that same exact word, you know, to make, is also translated to ordain. Clearly has the connotation, connotation of ordaining somebody. So maybe Mark was implying that in the use of that word, he made 12. Maybe has this implication of ordaining 12. Uh, but certainly these are apostles now. They are not just simply disciples. Let's think about that. All right, in Luke's gospel, he sent 70 out, okay, in chapter 10. In chapter 9 in Luke's gospel, he sends out the 12 on this, like, missionary journey. But uh, then he sends out 70 in the next chapter, in chapter 10. All right, there were lots of people following our Lord. In Luke's gospel, there's a whole bunch of people that he has to choose from. He stays up all night praying before he makes this selection of his apostles in chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, he went into the hills to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God, all night. Because he had all these people following him, man. He had an entire uh, ginormous group of who knows how many. And then he called his 12 disciples. He called all his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. They are ones who are sent Okay, a disciple is just a student. They're generic disciples. Many people were following our Lord who were his disciples. 
even many women. Okay, but uh, these 12, he gives this title of apostle, one who is sent, uh, apostolane, okay, and this is somebody who's like an ambassador who comes with the authority of the one who sent them. All right, so this is a very, very important title that our Lord gives, and he alone, it's his prerogative who he's going to choose. All right, but he called to him his 12 apostles, and he made them, and uh, this is a, a large group of people following him. I mean, if you look at Acts chapter 1, Justice and Matthias are put forward as two guys who it says here, uh, you know, who are potentially going to take the place of Judas Iscariot, okay, who killed himself, all right, after he betrayed our Lord, he took his own life, all right, and so they want to find a replacement, St. Peter's like, look, let's, his office let another take, and so, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, Until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Somebody who's been with them since the beginning, since John was arrested, all the way until our Lord ascended into heaven. So presumably these are, these are men who have witnessed the resurrection and been with them all along. So just imagine that uh, there's a lot of disciples and to be selected, chosen, called out, and named an apostle is a big, big deal for these guys. All right. Uh, point's clear. Now, let's talk about how the tw choice of 12 points to the 12 tribes. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? Uh, when our Lord chooses 12. I mean, this is signaling a, a new Israel. All right. And that's what I want to press into a little bit here. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Uh, let's talk about how Israel began, because Israel began, okay, as one man, all right, ultimately. Uh, you have a guy named uh, Jacob, uh, who in Genesis 35, 38, has his name changed to Israel, uh, 30, 35, and he uh, wrestles with the man all night and stuff, and your name is no longer Jacob, uh, but you shall be called Israel. Israel shall be your name. Um, and uh, your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. It's also in verse 32. Chapter 32 and chapter 35, it's reiterated in 35, but in 32 is where he wrestles with that man all the, all night, that weird, mysterious encounter with this guy who wrestles him, and he, he changes his name in the morning. This man or this angel or whatever this was, this messenger of God, changes Jacob's name to Israel, which means one who strives with God. Okay? And uh, so that's the origin of the nation of Israel is one guy. His name was Jacob, and he has 12 sons eventually. And those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel, which eventually is constituted at the Exodus into one nation of Israel. All right, so... Our Lord chooses 12, hmm, just like, just like what? Just like the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 sons of Israel, okay? Uh, he chooses 12. He's like pointing to himself as like a new Jacob, all right? And this is more explicitly clear in John's gospel because in chapter 1, at the end, when he's introduced, uh, Philip introduces Nathaniel to our Lord, and our Lord knows Nathaniel. And a very interesting encounter. And, you know, he he has this exchange with him that we'll hear more about when we get down below. We're going to talk more specifically about Nathaniel. But ultimately, Nathaniel cries out, you are the king of Israel. Interesting. What does our Lord say? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. All right, that's very interesting. When you hear ascending and descending, what do you think of? You think of Jacob and his famous dream at Bethel, uh, precisely where he has this experience of uh, God. And uh, this place called Bethel, which is like, uh, where the heck is it? Hold on here. Yeah. Uh, and Bethel means house of God. 
Uh, but he has a very important initial encounter with the Lord there. And this, this vision, he dreams and, and experiences this vision of a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. The angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And, uh, and then this, this promise to Abraham is reiterated to him that by you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth bless themselves. Worldwide universal blessing is that promise is given to who? To Jacob at that point, whose name is later going to be changed to Israel, who's going to have 12 sons, who's going to, who are going to become the 12 tribes, who are going to become the nation of Israel. All right. And it is at this point, this, this encounter and this vision, this dream he has of this ladder. So keep that in mind. And this promise is made to him. Um, that all the families of the earth will bless themselves by your descendants. Wow. That's incredible, huh? When you think of all of that and then you read what our Lord says here. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He's saying, I'm the new Jacob. I'm the new Israel. All right. And uh, it's really a, that ladder. Uh, ascending and descending business. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who he had flipped the page and he says that very thing. That's very interesting. But he says that to Nicodemus in verse 13, chapter 3, verse 13. He says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Um, very interesting. All this ascending and descending. You can't help but think of Jacob's ladder. And you can't help but think that Jacob's ladder ultimately is a symbol of Christ. It's a symbol of the incarnation. That's what's really going on here. Uh, that our Lord is signaling uh, that, 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 that that initial descendant that all the 12 tribes originated from. I appeared to him at the very beginning okay, of his journey and, uh, and gave him this vision of this ladder with angels ascending and descending upon it. Okay, And uh, I am. That was a type, okay, a prefigurement, a foreshadowing of me, of my incarnation. I am the son of man. I am one like a son of man, but I'm not, I'm one like a son of man, okay? I'm like you in the sense that I share your nature, but he is a divine person who ascend, descends. Uh, no one has ever seen God. The only son of God who is in the bosom of the father, he has made him known. Okay, he is the man from heaven, St. Paul. He came down. Uh, and no one's been there before. All right, he came down. He's a man. From, he's otherworldly. He's from outside the cosmos, the physical cosmos. He came down into it, this son of God. Um, so he's human and divine, ascending and descending. He stands on the earth while he touches heaven. That's what's so interesting. It's the incarnation here, human and divine, but he is one divine person. So Jacob's ladder is a fascinating type. All right. If we really want to press into this thing, we got to think about who that guy is and what our Lord is doing here is like a new Jacob, a new Israel. All right. And, and he is constituting a new Israel. And this is almost exactly what... More or less what St. Paul says in Galatians 6.16. Uh, St. Paul says, Neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's all that matters. Peace and mercy be, be upon all who walk by this rule, upon the Israel of God. Upon the Israel of God. The church is that new Israel. Right? And... Uh, and how do you gain access into this nation, this holy nation of Israel now, this new Israel, uh, through baptism, becoming a new creation? Circumcision is obsolete. doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, St. Paul says. All that matters in this new Israel is that you will become a new creation. All right? Forget about those shadows. We want the substance. All right? Um, <clears throat> we hear in Hebrews. Now... Um, so, and you know, these guys that he's chosen, we can look further on in Matthew's gospel and skip all the way to chapter 19. 
And what's the picture we're going to have of those guys? Well, let's hear this. 1928 and following, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man shall sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, can't underestimate the importance of what's going on here with the choice of these guys. The supremacy of the new covenant over the old, okay, and of this new Jacob over the old, all right, um, and of these new sons of Jacob over the old, um, these foundation stones, that's what they're going to be called. When you look at the book of Revelation, I don't know if I mentioned that yet, but let's look at Revelation 21. Let's hear about the new Jerusalem in heaven for a second. Chapter 21, this incredible description of the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and this incredible radiance. It's got 12 gates, 12 tribes. Guess what? 12 tribes of the sons of Israel are inscribed on these 12 gates. And then at the bottom here, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 12 apostles of the Lamb. To be apostles. To be an apostle. To be sent. That means you have real, real authority. You contain the seal of the king. You can speak on his behalf. Write checks on his behalf. Make issue decrees on his behalf. What you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Our Lord's going to say in Matthew 18, he's going to say, take him to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector. Because truly I say to you, and uh, presumably he's saying this to all the apostles, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he says it in Matthew 16 to Peter himself alone. So in two instances, Matthew's Gospel 16 and 18, he's give, showing that these guys have real delegated authority. Real authority. It's incredible. Uh, they're not just disciples. These guys are apostles. This is an enormous change in status. So let's not confuse those two terms. You know, uh, to... Apostolic authority is a really big deal in this one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Okay, we have to get that into our brain. And the Son of God did this. We got to work with and go with what we got. All right, and this is what he did. I'm getting direct sunlight in here, it's starting to blast me. I think I'm going to pull pull that drape. All right, let's uh, see what else we can get into here. Uh, so 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 tribal leaders assisted Moses in the beginning of, chapter, of Numbers chapter 1. Uh, read verse 4 and 5, uh, and you'll hear about how Moses is instructed by God to choose t one representative from each of the 12 tribes to be his assistant to go with him. Uh, <clears throat> so just interesting. Uh, as we're talking about all this. Now, I want to talk about the number 70. Uh, this is very important. Uh, the number 70 uh, is interesting. Uh, you don't hear the number 70 in Matthew, but you do in Luke. As uh, I mentioned that in Matthew, he just sends the 12, but in Luke, in chapter 9, he sends the 12, but in chapter 10, he sends the 70. What's up with that? 70 of these guys. Why 70? All right, well, our Lord is not doing this just randomly. The number 70 is very, very important. Okay, the number 70 symbolizes the nations. If the number 12 symbolizes Israel, the number 70 symbolizes the nations uh, in a very serious way. Uh, first, we can begin with this, this table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, what we refer to as the table of nations. So you have the three sons of Noah. You have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? And then Ham's incestuous offspring, Canaan. But that's a whole other issue. All right. But you have in chapter 10 here, this table of nations, all the descendants of these four individuals, ultimately, when you add Canaan to the mix. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Uh, when you add them up, which I did, and you, it's a little painstaking, but Japheth, there's 14 generation. Ham, there's 19. 
Uh, Canaan, there's 11. And then Shem, there's 26. It adds up to 70, exactly. And uh, what does it say at the end of chapter 10? Well, it says, uh, these, are the, uh, these are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. So when there were no people, they were wiped out. These are the eight survivors that got off that ark on Mount Ararat or wherever the heck it was. All right, so look, it's a reboot. And the human race was wiped out, according to this story, okay? So the origin of all the nations on the face of the earth derived from Genesis chapter 10, hence we call this the table of nations. They descend from these four guys, everybody, all the nations. And these sons represent these nations that the number 70 is symboli symbolizes the nations. All right, now... Uh, what else is important about this number 10 and why is it so important? Well, there were 70 members of Jacob's household when he went out down into Egypt in Numbers, excuse me, in Exodus 1.5. So in Exodus, you hear, you know, that he had 70 members of his household. And it's, no, that's divine choreography. And in Genesis 1, Exodus 1, 4, uh, all the offspring of Jacob were 70 persons. So, yeah. This, this is no accident uh, that there were 70 that came down into Egypt, okay? And that's what's mentioned there at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And what does it say in Deuteronomy 32 eight? you got to connect this to Deuteronomy here, and we're going to see how all this fits together, all right? Because in Deuteronomy 32 eight, Pope Benedict points this out. And this is so interesting. Uh, when the Most High gave... Hold on. Tell me that. He fixed the bounds of the peoples, the Most High, okay? Um, according to the number of the sons of Israel, okay? Uh, the sons of Israel, was it saying in the beginning of Exodus? Third, there were 70. 70, yeah. 70 offspring. The offspring of Jacob were 70 persons. So he fixed the bounds of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Yeah, it gets translated God from the, from the Greek. But ultimately, in the Hebrew, uh, it is Israel, sons of Israel, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so when you connect Genesis 10, Exodus chapter 1, and Numbers, or Deuteronomy chapter uh, 32, verse 8, and put all this together, uh, what do you see? Well, the number 70 is the total number of all the nations. It's symbolic of the nations. There were 70 elders that ascended the mountain with Moses in Exodus 24, verse 4, and following there. That's kind of interesting. Um, and also, uh, the translation of the Septuagint. You hear me reference the Septuagint translation all the time? Okay, that was in the 2nd century B.C., a couple hundred years before Christ. This Greek translation of the Old Testament emerged out of Egypt. All right, And there were a lot of Greek-speaking Jews, and they were clamoring for a translation. In the language that everybody was speaking at the time, I mean, it was all around the Mediterranean world. People had familiarity with this Greek language. It was the land of trade and commerce, okay? Everybody had to know a little Greek if you want to get along and uh, lift and shift about, all right? So it was the lingua franca, so to speak, uh, kind of like maybe English is today a little bit. Uh, but uh, look, they, they got this translation so that uh, the Old Testament now that was written in Hebrew could be accessible to the world, to the nations all around the Mediterranean world. Well, guess what the story where those, where this name Septuagint comes from is the word 70. That's what Septuagint means in Greek. Okay, the 70, Septuagint. Okay, how interesting is that? This translation that was going to make the Hebrew Old Testament uh, scriptures accessible to the nations ultimately. That's what would happen 200 years before the coming of Christ. The 70 elders of Israel, these 70 rabbis, uh, went off separately and made their own translation. And when they got together, according to the legend of the Septuagint, uh, and it, uh, they, all their translations were identical. It was like a miracle. All right, that's the story. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line is... Uh, 
the 70, you know, so interesting because it's very important for the growth, spread, and development of Christianity that this Greek translation existed because it was the foundation for the New Testament, which was written in Greek. So now we had an Old Testament in Greek translated into Greek and a New Testament that was written in Greek, and the two of them merged together to form our Bible, folks. Okay, 27 books in the Old, 46 46 books in the old and 27 in the new. All right, so 72 books uh, of the Bible or 73, depending if you want to split up Jeremiah and Lamentations. All right, in the Old Testament. But look, um, <clears throat> the uh, fact of the matter is that that Septuagint translation is so vitally important and Christianity itself is ultimately this fulfillment, this grand fulfillment of God's master plan. From the very beginning, to bless all the families of the earth. This promise that he gave to Abraham, that he ratified and reiterated and confirmed with both Isaac and Jacob, okay? Um, that he's going to bring about a worldwide blessing. All the families of the earth will bless themselves by your descendants. That was always God's plan, all right? A worldwide family reunion of all the Nati, the word Natus is child or son, nations. The nations are the nati, the sons, plural of God. This whole thing is about a kata holocaust worldwide reunion, according to the whole, kata holocaust, not holocaust with a T at the end, uh, what happened in World War II with the Jews and uh, a terrible thing. Holocaust means whole, all right? Uh, according to the whole, kata holocaust, the Catholic Church is the fulfillment of God's master plan, this worldwide universal family of God that we have in the Catholic Holocaust Church. Awesome, huh? The number 70 for the Jews is very, very significant. When you hear Jews talk about it, they say seven is the number of the covenant, okay? The perfect number. But 10 for them, the 10 commandments, the number 10 it's numerical value. It's like a number of completion, all the single digits. And then for them, you kind of start over, you know, 10 plus 1 is 11, 12, you know. That's for them, the way they did in their numer enumeration or whatever. Uh, yeah, 10 was like the final number. And then you just, everything else is sequences of 10 at that point. So anyway, uh, 10 for them was a symbol of completeness. So you got the number of the covenant, seven, uh, the day of covenant, the day of Sabbath rest, times 10, which is like completion. Seven times 10, it's like seven to the max. All right. And for them, uh, this is like, this seven is like uh, completeness in the natural order, according to the Jews. I was reading this on some of their websites I was looking at. It was really interesting to me. Uh, but the thing is, what they say is that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to take us beyond 70. I was like, ooh, that really caught my attention. Because the fathers of the church talk about, they love to talk about the Ogdode. Okay, the Ogdode is the number eight. Okay, and the Ogdode is a symbol of Christianity. If seven is the symbol of Judaism, the seventh day, the day of Sabbath rest, why didn't our Lord rise from the dead on the day of Sabbath rest? Seems logical, right? Because we got a new covenant. Ah, behold, I'm doing new things. Okay, this new covenant is going to far surpass the old covenant. And it's fitting and appropriate that he start a new week to symbolize a new creation. That he would rise on the first day of the week, not on the seventh day of Sabbath rest, but on the eighth day, like a new week has begun here that was not lost on the fathers of the church they called it the Ogdode the number eight it's very important um, that this new creation emerge you know it's there were eight on the uh, ark at the time of the flood you know when God kind of rebooted the thing so there's kind of a reboot on the first day of the week there were eight uh, that were saved uh, at the flood St. Peter says and uh, uh, we can't can't miss that. That's very important. Yeah, eight. That is eight. We're saved through water. 
And baptism corresponds to this. So this idea of a new creation now, all right, on the day of the sun, the first day of the week, the day the Romans worshiped the sun god, this first day of the week, this new creation, all right, to go beyond the natural order uh, is what our Lord is really doing here. And the Jews even acknowledge that. They say the Messiah is going to come and he's going to take us beyond 70. And when we go beyond 70, we're going beyond the natural order. We're talking about the supernatural order. That's right. We're going to become a new creation in Christ, in the Christos, in the Messiah. Okay? We're going to become new creations. We're going beyond the mere number 70 and going into a realm that's entirely beyond the natural order, into the supernatural realm of the grace of Almighty God. This is just awesome stuff, bro. Now let's talk about let's talk about women for a second in the gospel story. There's a lot of women, but you know we don't hear about them as much in Matthew and Mark, but we do in Luke. Luke chapter eight verse three, he mentions the apostles here, and uh, then he also says the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna the wife of Chusa. Herod Stewart and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Many others. So there's a lot of women. You see that in that uh, television show. Everybody's watching. Father Father C and I are watching. Uh, it's pretty good. The Chosen. Season 2 is outstanding, I think. We are both giving it a thumbs up. I'm giving it a solid B+. Plus. Season 1, eh, B-. minus. It was all right, in my opinion. Uh, but season two, I'm taking it up a notch. I don't know if I'm going to go all the way to B+. Plus. I'm going to say, yeah, I'll give it a B+. Plus. I'm starting to believe this guy is the son of God. I'm starting to believe. It's, it's you know, the characters are really starting to develop. Sorry, I digress. All right, look, there's women following these apostles. Not only it's a large group, um, but there are women mixed into this group. Isn't that interesting that you catch that in... Uh, in Luke. Now, Pope Benedict says, now nah, I'm going to skip that point. The first in Matthew's gospel is Matthew. In Matthew. The first in Matthew's gospel is Peter. All right, Protos. So it's interesting the way he orders this. He says the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, don't miss that, underline that and highlight that. First, Protos, the Greek word. That the first is Simon, who is called Peter. Don't let that get by. That's very important in Matthew's gospel. Um, he's signaling, because that word protos is pretty strong, it can mean foremost, preeminent. Okay? Uh, so it's not just like, uh, first off we have, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But preeminently we have you know, you, there, there's a totally different connotation. So it's not just, let's see, we got, uh, first off, yeah, I think we got so-and-so, so-and-so, and then there's so-and-so, so-and-so. No, no, no. Uh, much more meaning in that word, protos, Simon, who is called rock, or Petros, Kephas, all right? And Andrew, his brother. Uh, so in all the listing of the apostles in the Synoptic Gospels, Peter is always named first. But it's just that in Matthew here, he actually says the word first, protos. Uh, guess who's always last? You better believe it. Judas Iscariot is always at the end of the list. So if you're preeminent, whatever the opposite of that is, uh, that's what you get at the end there. Now, um, to be with him. Yeah, I think I mentioned there how, you know, we're all his. We all called to belong to the Lord and the sense of possession in Matthew's gospel. He called to him his 12. I don't know if I've mentioned this other little expression that I like in Mark's gospel. He called them to be with him. That's just a beautiful preposition, with. Um, it's like the guy that, you know, when he, at least the two guys in Matthew's gospel, the two demoniacs, he drives out these uh, garrison demoniacs, the demons. He drives them out. And uh, 
Yeah, these guys want to be with him. At least in Mark's gospel, it's only one guy. And he says he wants to be with the Lord. He wants to become his follower. And our Lord says no and sends him to be a witness of all the good things God has done for him. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just love that preposition, with. We're all called to be with the Lord. Uh, and ultimately in heaven, you know, the Lord is going to dwell with us in chapter 21. I uh, love that. Uh, yeah, God himself will be with them. Uh, he will dwell with them. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. Uh, chapter 21, verse 3 and following. So uh, I just, it's a very consoling uh, word. Uh, so, yeah, these apostles are called to be with him. And, you know, we are with him and his successors, the priests and bishops and deacons, okay? But especially priests and bishops, you know, this life of celibacy for us, you know, we're with the Lord all the time. That's I sit in a chair right over there and I look at him. I'm up here with the Lord. Uh, yeah, I don't have a wife and kids. So it's me and the Lord, folks. Um, to be with the Lord is what I signed on for. Uh, all the time, uh, concerned with his business, uh, with his affairs, single-hearted for the Lord, uh, like second, like First Corinthians chapter seven, our Lord says that's a desirable state for somebody called to this apostolic work. It's a very desirable thing. Uh, the anxieties that you'll be freed from. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. The married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. So it's a very helpful thing, practically speaking, and, and also spiritually speaking. I have room uh, in my life to get up at 6 a.m. with my cup of coffee, my Keurig right there, fire up my coffee and sit in my chair with the Lord for a few hours before Mass, you know, and study the Word of God and contemplate these things and share them with you, okay? It's because I'm with the Lord. Uh, what am I doing uh, just the things that our Lord sent these apostles out to do. Casting out demons, baptizing, um, yep, laying hands on sick people and anointing them with oil. Uh, and uh, all these things I'm doing all the time, forgiving people their sins, doing do this in memory of me, preaching and teaching and healing. I'm doing the things that our Lord did I've been called, chosen to be with him. Uh, we can't just, no one has a right to the priesthood, okay? Um, Numbers 18.7, actually, uh, uh, God says, the priesthood is given to you as a gift, he says to Aaron. I give your priesthood as a gift. Uh, the priesthood is a gift. You know, we don't... Uh, have a right to it. Uh, our Lord chose men, and he only chose some men out of all those many other men that were following him and women. He chose these 12 guys. So, yeah, we can only do what our Lord did. Uh, we're not making this thing up. Church is not some sort of invention, human concoction. Uh, ultimately, uh, it's the Lord's initiative. We just do what the Son of God told us to do. Uh, and that is what he did. So we got to go with that. I got to shut this other thing. I'm going to get a fizzy water. Might make me. All right. Now, so no one has a right to the priesthood. It's a gift. All a man can do is offer himself to the church. Most applications get turned away. All right, uh, right off the top, those who get looked at go through the application process. Many of them are weeded out, but some of them might apply and actually get accepted to the seminary. But then they got a long period in the seminary where they're going to get constantly uh, reviewed and analyzed and, and assessed. Oh, my gosh, I had nauseam. All right, uh, by committees and by spiritual directors and formators, formation directors. Okay, you're constantly getting evaluated, evaluated, evaluated. You're in a fishbowl swimming around. I can do a great fish face, but I'm not going to do it right now. Uh, but uh, 
Yeah, that's what it feels like. All you can do is offer yourself to the church. The church has the power of discernment whether or not you become a priest. All right? On behalf of Christ. And um, so the church makes that ultimate call on behalf of Christ. It's a calling. You're called to it. I give you the priesthood as a gift. No one has a right to it. And many men gets, you know, um, sent away or not chosen. Most, the majority of those disciples, presumably, who were there in Luke chapter 5, were not chosen. Or Luke chapter 6, were not chosen. Uh, but our Lord prayed all night. And uh, and he chose those, those 12, uh, as Mark says, to be with him. All right, now let's talk about this heterogeneous bunch of guys. I think this is so interesting. They're so, so, such a heterogeneous bunch. Starting off, we got two zealots. All right, two guys who are zealots. What are zealots? Well, they're kind of an offshoot of the Pharisees. Okay, I don't know when. First, second century BC. Uh, they, this is like a spinoff uh, where they kind of become political activists, kind of coming up and out of the for Pharisaical interpretation of the laws who were kind of separatists, the Pharisees literally what the name means. The pure ones are separate ones. Now, these guys, who were their heroes, these zealots? People like Phineas, who pierced right through the body in the middle of Coetus, this Israelite man and a Moabite woman on the plains of Moab. Okay, and what does he do in the book of Numbers? He comes in there, Phineas, and whop, pierces them right through their bodies in the middle of Coetus. It's like Coetus interruptus. Sorry, terrible joke. And uh, But look, uh, zeal that he demonstrated, he was praised for. All right, and then you got characters like Elijah who come along. All right, Elijah was the one who overthrew, confronted, challenged, and eventually slew all 400 of these prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. All right, and uh, then you have Judas Maccabeus, the Maccabees, and their father, Mattathias, and how he killed that guy who ate the pork, okay, during this Greek persecution of the Jews in 1 Maccabees and then 2 Maccabees. You hear about all these martyrs, okay? So these people are activists who take action, and it is political, and it is violent, okay? And they become zealots. Uh, extreme, extremely earnest and zealous for the law, but also for the identity, the heritage, the freedom and independence of the nation of Israel. Um, so, and Israel's God. All right, so zealots. Our Lord chooses two of them. Uh, the first guy is Simon the Canaanian. He's referred to in both Matthew and Mark. But he's also referred to in Luke as the Zealot, Simon the Zealot, okay? But it's one guy. And uh, also Judas Iscariot, interestingly, I never heard this until I read this, and uh, uh, Pope Benedict said this in Jesus of Nazareth, that Judas Iscariot is named possibly from Sicarion, which is a radical variant of the Zealots, according to Pope Benedict. So uh, let's talk about that in contrast. You got two zealots. And then who do you have alongside them that our Lord calls? A tax collector who's working for the Romans, Matthew or Levi. Isn't that unbelievable? Uh, yeah, you got two zealots. And then, you know, here's this guy who sold out to the Romans. And I... Uh, that is really messed up. But there's something so cool about this whole hodgepodge assortment our Lord chose. Four fishermen come next. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. We know a little bit more about them. They factor in bigger in the story. Uh, but yeah, these four fishermen. Hey, they're, they're, they're trades guys. You know, I want to defend trades guys because trades guys are smart. All right. We're not as look as we dumb. Uh, I'm one myself. I came up and through and out of the trades. I'm a blue-collar guy, all right? Truck and tools and 
the whole thing, all right? So I was a carpenter for four or five years. During a period of eight years, I spent about four or five of them working hard, full-time in the carpentry trade, remodeling houses, pounding nails, and sawing boards. Uh, that's, 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 that was a very formative experience for me in my background. Uh, and these guys are trades guys. You know, that practical wisdom that you gain from working day after day in a trade or anything you're doing that's practical in nature. Okay, you're a problem solver when you're a carpenter. And you're a wise builder. You have to be wise and do things in a systematic, streamlined, ordered way to construct or build things together. All right, so there's a lot of wisdom that you just naturally get. Problem solving ability in ancient times when there was a problem, any kind of problem. Not necessarily a carpentry problem, but any kind of problem the community was facing. Oftentimes people would, would call, consult with the village carpenter to help solve the problem. All right, so I know these guys aren't carpenter, but our Lord was a carpenter and he came up out of the trades. And these guys are fishermen and they have practical skill and ability. And I worked around so many different carpenters and they're some of the smartest guys I know. All right, so uh, just because they don't have letters after their name, don't underrate, underestimate their intelligence. They might just have a high school education. They're smart guys. Um, now, so these fishermen, yeah, our Lord chooses. Throw them into the mix. This is quite a goulash we're throwing it and putting together here in the pot. Um, now, Philip and Andrew... Uh, are two guys who have Greek names, and they must have had dealings with the Greeks. They must have known some Greek uh, because they've been exposed to Greek culture. They got Greek names, and uh, and they're the ones in John uh, chapter 12 when the Greeks come to meet our Lord. They want to meet the Lord. They can't get to him. They got to get through the apostles, so they come to him. And uh, who intercepts them? Who makes the introductions? Who mediates? Is the go between between Jesus? And this mysterious little grouping of Greeks, people who, Greek-speaking people who want to talk to the Lord. Sir, we wish to see Jesus, these Greeks, some Greeks. And uh, who do they go to but Andrew and Philip? Andrew went with Philip. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew went with Philip and they told Jesus. All right, so look, uh, that's just interesting. Throw them into the mix, this little stew concoction here. Uh, next we got... Let's talk a little bit more about Philip. Philip's interesting. Philip's interesting on a number of levels here. First of all, in John chapter 1, he's the one that calls Nathaniel. Okay, otherwise known as Bartholomew. We'll get to him in a little bit. But it's Philip who makes introductions between Nathaniel and our Lord. Uh, pretty neat. And he says those famous words in John 1, 46. Come and see. When Nathaniel sounds skeptical... Uh, and he's like, what good comes out of Nazareth can come out of Nazareth? He's like, come and see. Uh, so really neat. And then it was Jesus who said to Philip, uh, right before this miraculous multiplication of the loaves and fish in John chapter 6, which led in ultimately to this great bread of life discourse. Uh, in the beginning of John chapter 6, verse 5 to 7, there's a little interesting exchange between Jesus and Philip. Jesus said to Philip, how are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? This he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. Of course, our Lord goes on to multiply the loaves and the fish because he knew what he was going to do. But it's just interesting to see Philip in that story, to see him active and playing a role in the Gospels, and it doesn't stop there. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, it is Philip that goes to this village in Samaria and begins the work of evangelization. And then right after him, who follows behind, but Peter and John continue this work. But Philip gets it started. Then the Spirit whisks him up and takes him, and he's walk, going down this road, and there's this chariot, okay, with this Ethiopian eunuch reading Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip says... Do you understand what you're reading? And very interesting words from the Ethiopian eunuch. He says, how can I unless somebody guides me? That's very important. How can I unless somebody guides me? You know, the scriptures are like the horse. 
The catechism is like the distillation of the church's tradition, okay? Capital T, tradition, which is really 2,000 years of reflecting on this or riding this, okay? They go together like horse and rider. So what this Ethiopian eunuch said uh, so succinctly, how can I understand what I'm reading? How can I guide this horse and find pasture and know where to go? Unless somebody guides me, I need a guide. That's what the catechism really is. The proper lens with which to read this. So our Lord didn't write anything. He didn't tell the apostles necessarily to write. But, but he gave them a lens of interpretation. And they would hand that lens down to others. A way of understanding things, of uh, a formation that he gave them, something interior uh, that's written on their hearts, that is conveyed or transmitted. It's a very tricky thing to explain to somebody, uh, but I think the clearest distillation that we have is that catechism of the Catholic Church containing all the councils of the church, teachings of popes and councils and saints and theologians from all 2,000 year plus history of the church. All right, so it's, it's very important uh, to see this. And what's so interesting is Philip's name means horse lover. Isn't that great? That the Lord chooses, the Spirit chooses to send this guy whose name means horse lover. You know, this is like the horse right here. And, uh, and here he sends one of the apostles with apostolic authority to show this Ethiopian eunuch how to ride that horse. He sends him a horse lover. A man of the scripture of the word of God who loves the word of God. That's the way I like to interpret that. But So Philip. All right, let's move on. Doubting Thomas. Got to talk about Thomas now. He's kind of a glass half empty type of guy. Okay, kind of doom and gloom. Seems like he's kind of anxious, nervous type of guy. Uh, you know, three times in John, he's referred to as Didymus, which equal, that means twin. All right. Uh, but but Thomas, all right, here's some of the statements of Thomas in John chapter 11 when they're, our Lord's going to take the apostles on this little trip, side trip. They're going to go see Lazarus. He's going to raise him from the dead. He's going to wake him up. All right, and uh, interesting, Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. I don't know. They're not even walking that far. It just kind of seems like a strange statement. And you just wonder if it's like, laced with a certain cynicism. I don't know what, uh, but it's kind of an odd thing to say. Um, oddly enough, later he's going to go to India and eventually be put to death. Um, but those people are very proud of their heritage, tracing it to the Apostle Thomas. I've talked to some who, uh, yeah, they absolutely believe that the, pro uh, the Apostle Thomas came to India. Uh, they're very proud of that uh, there. Now, he also says, Lord... In John 14, verse 5, he says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? To which our Lord famously, famously responds, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. All right, but those that was solicited by Thomas when he made that interesting question. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? You know, you just, again, he just sounds kind of nervous. And then here at the end with the famous words in John chapter 20, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. So this guy, Thomas, became a great saint and he was chosen by our Lord. But he wasn't perfect. All right. And uh, yeah, these guys aren't perfect. They got, they're rough around the edges. That's the way the Lord likes them, it seemed like. And let's talk about Bartholomew. This guy's a character. I like him. Bartholomew. I was stationed at St. Bartholomew's for a couple of years in Bethesda. And I got to be friends with St. Bartholomew in a certain sense because I researched his life back then. And I took all these pictures and did all this research when I was in Rome and um, <clears throat> offered a mass at the Church of St. Bartholomew. It's on an island um, in the middle of the Tiber River. But... Uh, but anyway, so uh, Bartholomew was comic relief, I like to think, in the apocryphal literature. Um, 
Again, it's not, it doesn't have the authority of sacred scripture, but, you know, there's some value to it, maybe. Uh, and it says in there that he was kind of a character, that he was kind of lighthearted, that he was funny. Okay, he lightened things up. You got Thomas, this guy who's like nervous and kind of whatever. Sunglasses type of guy and then uh, kind of dark. Uh, and then you have Bartholomew Comic Relief. Uh, Bartolome, Bartolmai. Uh, it just means son of Tolmai. So that's not really a name. Uh, his real name is Nathaniel. Okay, I mean, most scholars would equate those two. Okay, Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same guy. That's his real name, Nathaniel. Uh, Bar means son, Tolme, son of Tolme. So I guess that's what he started to be called, Bartholomew. Um, but anyway, he's known as Nathaniel and John. Very direct. The guy's very direct. You know, what good comes out of Nazareth? And our Lord's like, you know, says something to him. And he's like, how do you know me? You know, he says to the Lord, uh, yeah, he seems like he's very direct. And our Lord says something interesting. He says, here's a true Israelite without guile. Okay, and the word is like deceit. Okay, the, he's not a trickster. All right. And uh, so that's interesting because he's a true Israelite. Who's Israel again? Jacob. When he says a true Israelite, think about it. Jacob is Israel, has his name changed to Israel. And what was Jacob like? Well, he Jacob people, okay? He was a trickster. He was deceptive. Uh, he, yeah, there's a certain guile with this guy, uh, Jacob. And, uh, but here's an Israelite, true Israelite, without guile, our Lord says to him. Now, let's move on. James the Lesser, the son of Alphaeus, um, this is interesting because he could be potentially the brother of Matthew, believe it or not. If you look at Mark 2.14, uh, Matthew is described as the son of Alphaeus. All right, so maybe they're brothers. That's interesting. Uh, but uh, he's also known as James the Lesser because James, the brother of John, okay, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of Thunder, these fishermen up above we already mentioned, uh, he is called James the Greater. Okay, this is James the Lesser, the son of Alphaeus. Um, there's three different James, and it's hard to get it all straight. We've got to keep this nice and clear, okay? Uh, there's also a Thaddeus, a Judas, okay, another Jude, um, who, you know, uh, we got to talk about as well, but some people, even fathers of the church, even St. Thomas Aquinas, I'm going to have to great, I'm going to have to diverge from the great angelic doctor. I can't believe that, but uh, I'm going with modern scholarship on this one, folks. So the James, the lesser here, and this Thaddeus, which means courageous, uh, who's also known as Judas or Jude. Okay, Jude. Um, the son of James. Or in John, he's, he's mentioned as uh, Judas, not Iscariot. Okay. Um, so these two guys, we have to make some key distinctions about. Um, I do not think that these are the same authors of the New Testament letters of James and Jude. All right. Because I think there's a third James, and there's a third Jude, okay? Because there are also, uh, there's also, look at Mark chapter 6 at the beginning there, when our Lord goes to uh, Nazareth, and it mentions very explicitly that our Lord had these cousins, these Adelphi, okay, Adelphoi. Hang on a sec, I got to plug this thing in. Battery's running low. You there? You with me? All right. Now, yeah. So in Mark chapter six, you see, uh, yeah, his brothers and sisters are mentioned here. Uh, of course, the word the word is Adelphos and Adelpha or Adelphoi, Adelphi. Okay, these are these are kinsmen and kinswomen. Okay, uh, relations, uh, cousins. Our Lord didn't have brothers and sisters. That's the Catholic view. 
all right, uh, brothers and sisters in the sense of siblings, in the strict sense. Uh, these are brothers and sisters from another mother, all right, cousins, a.k.a. cousins. And it says here that, uh, isn't this Jesus? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. All right, but these names are mentioned here. James, Joseph, Judas, Simon. Judas and James. Wow. Who are these guys? Well, they're the brothers of the Lord, the cousins of the Lord, who did not believe in our Lord. I do not believe that they became apostles. I do not believe that they are identical to these guys listed here um, in this uh, Matthew chapter 10. All right. Not the same guys, different guys. All right. Why would I say something like that? Well, one good reason is because in John chapter seven, it says in verse four, um, four and five, you know, his even his brethren did not believe in him. Even his cousins, they didn't believe in him. All right. Our Lord didn't choose his own cousins to be his apostles. All right, so I, I, I do not believe that. I believe that uh, James, the son of Alphys, we don't know much about him, but I believe the author of those two New Testament letters are actually the brothers of the Lord who were there at Pentecost. They later came to believe. And James, this James, the brother of the Lord, we have James the greater, James the lesser, the son of Alphys, and then we have this James the Just, who is the cousin of our Lord, who becomes the first bishop of Jerusalem, all right, who's mentioned in Galatians chapter 1 by St. Paul. And he's mentioned by St. Paul also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Lord appeared to him. The risen Lord appeared to his own cousin, James, who became known later as James the Just and became the first bishop. He was very prominent, okay, because, uh, and, um, uh, he was there, he was speaking at the Council of Jerusalem. That was not James, the son of Alphaeus. And it certainly wasn't James, the greater, who was killed in Acts chapter 12 with a sword. Herod had him killed with a sword. Uh, so in Acts chapter 15, three chapters later, here's this James character that has all this authority in Jerusalem at the first Council of Jerusalem. Who the heck is this guy? Well, it's not James, the greater, who was killed in Acts chapter 12 with a sword, okay, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, that James is gone, all right? And I do not believe it is James, the son of Alphaeus, James the lesser. I do not think it is him. I think this James they're talking about, I believe with modern scholarship, I agree with them that this is a third James, who's one of the brothers of the Lord, who was there at Pentecost, who our Lord appeared to. In Acts chapter 1, it says that uh, at Pentecost, all these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer, the apostles, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, otherwise his cousins, his Adelphoi. Okay, they were there at Pentecost. And uh, our Lord, it says, appeared to this James the Just, who was also known as Camel Knees, because he prayed so much. And eventually he was thrown off the parapet of the temple. He still didn't die, so they killed him with a sword or they stoned him or something, according to tradition. Uh, so that's my interpretation of this whole thing. Uh, it's hard to keep this stuff straight because there's three different James and there's three different Judes or Judases. Judas Iscariot, the Apostle Judas, and then this brother of the Lord named Judas, okay? All right, uh, hopefully I didn't get you too confused on that. Is there anything I missed on that? Uh, Judas, yeah, while we're talking about Judas, uh, Judas, the good Judas, not Iscariot, okay? The one who's called Thaddeus, okay? Courageous one is what Thaddeus means, all right? Um, he says at one point, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So he does get a line. This guy gets a line, John 14, 22. Um, so anyway, uh, little details uh, that I want to point out in Mark before we move on. Uh, that In Mark, they're sent out two by two. Uh, and I think that's great. I really like that. I wish if there was enough priests that we could do dual ministry. It, it's amazing. I like to take uh, either a lay person or I've taken religious sisters or somebody out with me on sick calls 
when you go to hospitals and nursing homes and hospice care centers and people's homes, it's amazing how powerful that ministry is when it's two. It's like a multiplication, force multiplier, man. It's just incredible. And uh, the support that you have and the extra set of eyes and just the, uh, the debriefing that you can have, uh, it's just incredible. The, um, it's just much better quality ministry in some ways uh, when it's done two by two. Um, it's not as stressful. It's much easier. It's just easier to accomplish a task with someone else sometimes. When you have somebody else bearing the load of a, something that's difficult, uh, it just makes it a lot easier. Walking in that hospital with somebody else instead of just you going in there by yourself. There's not many priests, and most priests, you know, we're just solo operators, you know. We're kind of uh, mavericks, and uh, in some respects, that's the way we are used to operating in our ministry. And I've been experimenting in recent years with uh, a cooperative team style or dual ministry with another person. Oh, man, it's great. Really enjoy it. Makes it more fun and enjoyable and I think effective. All right, so two by two in Mark chapter six, verse seven. Also in Mark six thirteen, it talks about anointing with oil that our Lord sent them out to lay hands on sick people and anointed with oil. Many that were sick and healed them. Anointed with oil. Okay, where do we get this practice of putting oil on people? Well, this is a little seed of it right here in the Gospels. Apparently, our Lord, presumably, told them to do this. I mean, uh, had them do this, anoint with oil. Uh, because it's in James chapter 5 that you see a clear reference to it now. As it says, are there any sick among you? Let them, say, let them send for the priests of the church. Let the priests pray over them, anointing them with, the, with oil anointing them with oil uh pray over them anointing them with oil that is so important in the name of the lord anointing him with oil in the name of the lord prayer of faith will save the sick person the lord will raise them up if they have committed any sins their sins will be forgiven them okay so look at mark chapter 6 verse 13 and and james chapter 5 that's where we get this practice of the uh anointing with oil but it's right there in the gospels and we're just doing it presumably because our lord told us to do it anything else we want to mention here these guys are common uneducated men they're sent out and they don't have full preparation it's not like you know gosh they're still in formation it's like me i remember getting sent to the hospital with pics of hosts and you know i didn't have all my formation all right sometimes you just got to get thrown in all right uh, so they have minimal formation here, and they're sent out uh, to do these things. It's pretty impressive. Just getting thrown into the deep end. I um, mean, these guys are technically still seminarians, you know, in a certain sense. Uh, they're in formation. They have maybe a year or two of formation under their belt, and they're being thrown out there into this uh, missionary work. Uh, it's pretty impressive. And, you know, and they don't have any degrees after their name or letters after their names. All right, so they're not formally educated, any of them, to my knowledge. Maybe Matthew was. I don't know. Uh, but they're common, uneducated men, according to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Okay, they are agramatoi and idiotai. Okay, uh, agramatoi means unlettered, unlettered or uneducated. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that they couldn't read. Some people go a little too far with that and say that, see, Peter was illiterate. Because it's talking about Peter and John here. And the Sanhedrin are eyeballing these guys when they get drug in before the Sanhedrin. And they're like looking at them and they perceived that they were common, uneducated men. Recognized that they had been with Jesus. So they're just kind of amazed at the boldness of these guys. And they're like, man, these guys, they are agramatoi. Okay? Uh, they haven't studied anywhere and received any official formal degrees. All right? But... My hunch is they still had Hebrew school growing up, and they still learned their letters. I think they were they were lettered men. That's my uh, belief on that. Um, and but you know they're common men. They're not involved in public affairs. That's essentially what that means. Idiotai. What is an idiot? He's one to himself. Okay, he's just kind of one who's just yeah concerned with himself 
and not, I don't mean selfish, I just mean like a commoner, okay, not involved in public affairs, not a mover and a shaker, okay, so that's the sense of that word uh, is, uh, of course, in our, when we hear that word, we think of an idiot, you know, uh, somebody who's, uh, needs a checkup from the neck up, I've been waiting for a chance to say that, an idiot, uh, no, it's just, you know, they're common, they're, they're common men, um, now, uh, that's who our Lord chooses, and I, I just love it. And he throws them out there with, with, with minimal, you know, with, without being fully prepared. So if we think, keep making the excuse that, oh, I can't open my mouth and do apostolic work, apostolic ministry. I don't have any formal certificate. I don't have any, hey, we're all called to do this work. These guys could have used that excuse. Sometimes you just got to get out there and try. Do the best you can. All right. Um, now, Jesus chose and invited them. We already talked about that. It's his prerogative. And, uh, you know, it's interesting who he chooses. We've already seen this heterogeneous bunch, this big goulash. Think of the priests in our own time, man. When you go to a big mass sometime at the cathedral, wherever you are, or some big mass with a lot of priests, sit there and watch them go by in procession or recessing out of the church or cathedral. It is really entertaining in a certain sense to look at these guys. Man, they're all different types, shapes, sizes, all kinds of different backgrounds. So interesting. Guys from the military, guys who are lawyers, doctors, guys who are dentists, guys who, uh, like me, came out of the trades, guys who are bush pilots, guys who are mixed martial artists. <laughs> It's pretty funny, you know, so many different types of guys. Some tall, lanky guys with a cane, stooped over and a big nose. Other short, pudgy guys, portly and, you know, walking duck-footed down the aisle. Uh, it's just like hilarious. It's really hilarious. When I flip through the priest pictorial directory, and I know these guys and love them, and it's just like, man, I feel like I'm part of this great tradition of the priesthood. We're just human beings, all right? Human beings that our Lord has shared, elevated uh, to the status of the priesthood as a gift, okay? Uh, Numbers 18.7, a gift. And he's configured us to himself. Christ, the high priest, has shared his priesthood with us. And, uh, but otherwise, you know, we're just, we've been given a privileged formation that you all paid for, by the way. Thanks for that. Uh, seriously. And, um, you know, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for this gift of this vocation. Uh, but uh, we're just human beings. So, gosh, if I have a charism in my priesthood, I would say it's to be a human being. All right. So, uh, yeah, our Lord was very comfortable with his humanity. And uh, I like to think I am, too. So, uh, yeah, don't want to try to be too holy, pious, or so try to be something we're not. I mean, obviously, the priesthood is holy, and we handle the holy things, and I get all that. Uh, but in the midst of it, we're human beings. Uh, join the human race, for crying out loud. So I really, yeah, that whole business of, uh, you know, clericalism, you know, is, uh, yeah, that is repulsive, that whole notion uh, to me. And so unchristlike uh, to think of. of... All right, now... Um, yeah, enough about that. Let's see. Um, so I, I want to make a point here when he says in Matthew chapter 10 here. Let's go back. When he says, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know, most of the commentaries I see both ancient, Middle Ages, and modern all seem to concede that this means our Lord is just talking about the order, the sequence within which the gospel is to be preached. And they cite things like Acts chapter 1 before our Lord ascends. And he tells them to, look, take this message, this gospel from, and uh, be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You know, there's this natural outgrowth begins with Jerusalem and goes out. And St. Paul, you know, they'll cite examples of how he went first to the Jew, then the Greek, you know. Um, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. 
I haven't heard anybody articulate this, but this is my own personal theory I'm putting out there right now. But I think our Lord saying, go wherever you want. But just look, all these people are like lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't think of, any, of them anymore as Samaritans and Gentiles. I don't. They're children of God. All right. And this new covenant is going to open out to all the nations. All right. So that would make sense in the context of verse 23. So when you read five and six and then jump over to 23 and our Lord says something here. I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the son of man comes. All right. Well, all the towns of Israel. I think we could have done that by now, don't you think, in 2000 years? Uh, as the Son of Man come. So uh, what does our Lord really mean here? Uh, the towns of Israel is the whole world, the ends of the earth. Okay, Israel was destroyed, annihilated, absorbed into the nations. The ten northern tribes of Israel, this northern kingdom of Israel, they called themselves. Okay, they were wiped out by the Assyrians in the 8th century. And they were basically deported all over the place. And... You know, there may be remnants of these tribes, but ultimately they were kind of just absorbed back into the Gentiles, where they came from in the first place for lying out crowd. All right, with the call of Abram, a wandering Aramean from Ur of the Chaldees. So they kind of just, these 10 northern tribes that split off from the southern kingdom of Judah, all right, and Benjamin, those two tribes held together. And uh, so this was under the reign of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon who just taxed the people too heavily and just was imprudent, and this split occurred. Uh, and they warred against each other, the southern kingdom of Judah, the northern kingdom of Israel, and they fought each other and whatever. And eventually, in the 8th century, the Assyrians had enough of this northern kingdom of Israel, and they blasted them, right? And they left the pages of human history. So they're out there now. They are absorbed into the nations, and this is a very interesting thing to think about there's lots of prophecies, prophecy in the Old Testament about the reconstitution of the 12 tribes. How do you do that when 10 of them just got annihilated and absorbed, reabsorbed? Well, if you bring the Gentiles into this covenant, into this new covenant, aren't you effectively reuniting all the 12 tribes? All right, so that's where I'm coming from when I read this. Try reading it that way and uh, tell me if, uh, if you think it works. If not, report me to the Pontifical Biblical uh, Commission and maybe the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith will call me in for interrogation. Uh, but I'll wait for that call and we'll see what happens. Now, uh, let's move on. Our Lord gives them authority to cast out demons in his name. Awesome. Um, and to heal. It's a great quote here I want to read you from Pope Benedict in uh, Jesus of Nazareth, he says, when faith is absent, to, uh, I'm sorry, hold on, when understood at a sufficiently deep level, okay, what healing really is, when you're talking about healing, like, like Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord, your healer, healing, when faith, uh, when understood at a sufficiently deep level, this expresses the entire content of redemption, page 176, of Jesus of Nazareth, um, the entire content of the redemption that is so Catholic is about restoration of our nature, a healing of our nature, not just covering the dung hill with snow. Okay, the dung heap, the pile up boop, with snow. Okay, not just forgiveness and cancellation of a debt. Redemption is more than just buying us back. This like exchange. This. Okay, this or this juridical act coming down from above by God's authority in this declarative juridical act. Okay, no, it's more than that. It's about going inside of us, about the grace of God going inside, penetrating us from the inside out uh, and renewing us from within. We become a new creation, sanctifying grace going inside that pile. Of, well, I don't believe we're a pile of dung. Okay, Uh so I disagree right there. But certainly we're deeply, deeply wounded. But the grace of God, the finished work of the grace of God is to heal our nature. That's redemption. That is Catholic. To be sanctus, to be whole. 
All right, so uh, yeah, I love that quote. I'm going to read one more time from Pope Benedict. When understood at a sufficiently deep level, healing, this concept of healing in the scriptures and in salvation history, when understood at a sufficiently deep level, this expresses the entire content of redemption. Yeah! Pope Benedict. I like, I love that guy. Oh, man. All right, so they're also told to raise the dead. Does that mean physically or spiritually? Uh, what exactly is going on there? Uh, raise the dead. You only find that in Matthew's missionary discourse. Raise the dead. Dang. These guys have been in the seminary a couple years. They're going to start raising the dead. Now, is that to be interpreted physically or spiritually is the question on the table. I'm going to say maybe both. You know, certainly there's not like there's no precedent. Our Lord raises people from the dead. The widow of Nain's son, uh, Lazarus, uh, Jairus' daughter. Okay, uh, but look, and you got in the Old Testament, you got examples of Elijah and Elisha raised the dead. You got uh, Acts of the Apostles, you got Peter and Paul raised the dead. All right, are these guys raising the dead? That's incredible. Uh, but it could also be, you know, spiritual death. Uh, because we've got to look at a couple different texts here. There is such a thing as spiritual death. First thing we can look at is just simply Luke chapter 15 and the prodigal son. Think of these words that the father says to the elder son um, at the very end of that chapter 15, verse 32. He says, it was fitting to make merry and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive he was lost and is found so i love it he was in a, a place of spiritual death you know um and he came home and became alive again uh was reconciled to me so these guys are going out there and yeah maybe there's a sense in which uh they are um uh, Maybe they're raising people from the dead physically, but could also be spiritual. And First uh, John, you know, he talks about this distinction in chapter 5 between mortal sin and venial sin. Okay, and he says there is a sin which is mortal. Uh, this is chapter 5, verse 16 and following here, 16 and 17. Uh, <clears throat> there's sin which is not mortal, and there's sin which is mortal. Okay, uh, that kills you, kills the life of God within you kills your soul, your spiritual life. You are walking dead. You're like those Pharisees in Matthew 23 coming up when he's going to land base them and say, you are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones and all corruption. He's going to say, you know, you're walking dead. Um, zombies are very popular. The walking dead. Um, and uh, so healing, healing, healing. Yeah, and uh, raising dead. While we're talking about raising dead, we should talk about Revelation chapter 3, verse 2 and 3 here. Uh, he's The angel of the church of Sardis is uh, chewing these people out in Sardis uh, and saying to them, I know your works. You have the name of being alive and you're dead. Wow, that's like uh, scary. Like the movie... Uh, what you call it with Bruce Willis? I see dead people. Uh, what the heck is that? I've seen it 8 million times. Um, anyway, I, I like that movie. And uh, when you realize you're dead, you know, man, <laughs> it's great. It got me. It got me big time. Okay, in that movie. I did not see that coming. Oh. Well, I didn't even say what the movie was, but in case you haven't seen that movie, I might have just screwed it screwed it up for you. All right, so I better just shut up. All right, look, but anyway, some of these people are going to find out they are dead and they're going to come back to life. They're going to be restored to life by the ministry of these apostles. Some of them maybe physically, but some of them spiritually. Uh, now, let's move on. Shake off the dust. You know, he tells them, shake off the dust. You're going to see this in Acts chapter 13. You know, St. Paul's going to shake the dust off. The uh, Jews at Antioch and Pisidia are reviling him. And they're inciting the crowd to jealousy and contradicting him. All right. Look, stirring up a persecution. 
They drove him out of the town, these Jews of Antioch of Pisidia. And uh, so what do they do? The disciples were filled with joy, first of all, but they shook the dust, shook off the dust of their feet, from their feet against them, and they just moved on. They were filled with joy. Uh, pretty neat. So anyway, that's a very Jewish thing. You leave a Gentile place, you know, you shake the dust off of your feet. That was a kind of a common Jewish uh, practice I read. Now, um, anything else interesting here? References to Sodom and Gomorrah are always interesting to me. You hear that in uh, Isaiah and in Jeremiah. But I just want to look at Isaiah here because here he is. He's like a, you know, fancy guy. He's a courtier. He's like, you know, a higher up. He's a, he's he's a, he's a, he's in the nobility like yeah, Isaiah the prophet, he, and he he's he's moving around amongst all the uh, the movers and the shakers, boy. And he calls them Sodom. He calls them rulers of Sodom and people of Gomorrah. I mean, that is a really vile insult. Uh, that is that wow. Uh, you hear the same thing in Jeremiah at a certain point, chapter twenty three, but. Our Lord is uh, speaking about this here as well. Uh, I'd be better off for them if they were in Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. Um, he says it other places in the Gospels too, when he land based, for instance, uh, Capernaum and Bethsaida. Uh, and he says, you know, yeah. Anyway, all right. Now, I got to, we're getting, I think I'm up to an hour and a half at this point. I really. Got to try to move here. Uh, so doves and serpents. Uh, one thing I like about that, I was reading uh, some stuff that I read by Frank Sheed and Fulton Bishop Fulton Sheen. You know, just the honesty of Jesus. Like he doesn't do a little bait and switch on us. You know, he tells us it's going to be tough. You're going to suffer. You're going to get persecuted. But don't we want adventure? A bold undertaking in which hazards are to be encountered and the issue is staked upon unforeseen events. That's the Webster's unabridged uh, dictionary definition of an adventure. A bold undertaking. There's going to be hazards and the issue is staked upon unforeseen events. We don't know what's going to happen. Our Lord tells us this is going to be an adventure. Buckle up. All right. And he tells us there's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be a cross and take up your cross day by day. Don't we want a challenge? Wouldn't you love it if a used car salesman came out and told you where the dings are and that thing clunks when you hit the brakes hard and it makes kind of a squirrely noise from the rear uh, wheel well when you turn uh, to the left? All right, we would love uh, if we had an honest used car salesman. Our Lord's not doing a bait and switch and he's not hiding anything under the bumper, okay? Our Lord is telling us straight up and he's challenging. There's something about that that's attractive and winsome. Uh, people want to respond to challenge and adventure. I love it to that point. Fulton Sheen or Bishop Fulton Sheen or Frank Sheed uh, said, I thought that was pretty cool. Now, um, next, uh, let's talk about fear. You know, putting the truth out there and have no fear. Don't be afraid. There's a passage I like in Isaiah here, chapter 8, uh, and where we shouldn't be afraid of people. You know, do not fear. We shouldn't be afraid of what the world's afraid of, okay? Those who run after things and are dominated by the birds and the rocks and the thorns, okay, are running after their farm and their business, all right? These are the people that are going to have tremendous anxiety, anxiety. Uh, because they're running after worldly things, all right? We're going to have anxiety enough. Uh, but yeah, do not fear what they fear, what the world fears, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him shall you fear. Him shall you regard as holy. And, and let him be your dread, you know? Uh, just be concerned with the Lord, with your relationship with God. Uh, concern yourself with him and his righteousness let all these other things, you know, our Lord says, said earlier in Matthew's gospel. And he'll take care of all that in chapter, chapter 6. It's nice to hear that again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be yours as well. You know, don't, don't fear. Don't be afraid. 
our Lord says, have no fear of them. Nothing is covered that will be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Put the truth out there. The truth has a persuasive power of its own. Even if you lose the argument, don't worry about it. Okay, walk away. You spoke the truth the best you could. Next time it'll be that much sharper and clear. All right, and just let it go to work. Let it do its work in that person. All right, uh, it's going to be effective. Truth has a persuasive power of its own. Have no fear of them. And have no fear for yourself that you're going to look stupid. Um, so now, hairs of the head. That's interesting because in 40, Psalm 40, verse 12, our Lord says something that I wonder if he's alluding to here. Uh, when he says, 40, 12. Um, you know what? I think I screwed this up. It's not 40. Oh, man, where is it? 47? Uh, wherever it is, like now I can't find it. Uh, well, I know how I can find it. I can just look at Matthew here. So I'm pretty sure I would have put it in the margin. And I did. I can't read my own writing. I think that says 40 verse 12. But isn't that where I just was? And I didn't see it. Now, what it says is that uh, our sins are like the hairs of our head. It's right here. I don't know what I was looking at. For evils have encompassed me without numbers. Number. My iniquities have overtaken me till I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. The iniquities are more than the hairs of my head. Um, hmm. Psalm 40, verse 12. When our Lord says all the hairs in our head have been counted. Yeah. It's just probably coincidence. Um, but, you know, you just have to wonder. Somebody as steeped in the scriptures as our Lord is. Um, is he alluding to things, you know, when he refers to the hairs of our head? Uh, God knows everything. Any sin that we've ever committed, he knows everything about us, whether good or bad. All right. Uh, all the hairs in our head have been counted and we are worth more than many sparrows. And we're, we're how much more value is a man than a sheep? Okay. So 1031, uh, Matthew 12, 12, how much more value is a man than a sheep? Right in chapter 6, remember, are you not of more value than they, these birds of the air? Okay, yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Chapter 6, verse 26. Okay, why are you anxious about clothing? Look at these lilies of the field that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. Look, they have an expiration date. You do not. See, that's what we got to realize. We have a soul with no expiration date. It is incorruptible. It is immortal. You have never met a mere mortal, folks. Every single one of us that's made in the image and likeness of God. If we were the only ones in this physical cosmos made in the image and likeness of God, with possessing a soul that is not part of the physical universe that God fashioned special and poured into us, the most noble part of us is not part of this physical universe and has no expiration date. It is immortal. That's who we are, the most noble part of us. When our body decays in corruption, our soul will perdure. Uh, so any single one of us has more value, worth, and dignity than the entire physical universe and everything in it. If we were the only beings that have this soul in the physical universe that are made in God's image and likeness. And God had to choose between one of us and the entire physical universe and everything in it. He would choose us. He would choose you. He would choose me if we were the only one made in his image and likeness. In this enormous physical cosmos. And he had to choose between us, me, you, or this entire physical, he would choose us. He would choose any single one of us over the whole physical cosmos and everything in it. The entire planet Earth. Think about that when you're laying in bed tonight. We have no idea who we are, folks. The nobility of a human person, regardless of race or color or sex or age. It doesn't matter if you're a zygote that can hit on the, fit on the head of a pencil. Okay, the tip of a pencil. Uh, you have a soul that is immortal and incorruptible. 
so awesome. So, so very, very awesome. Uh, the worth and dignity of the human person. So the sword is interesting to me. Um, kind of running out of time, but I don't know if I want to press into that too much. Uh, the sword. All right, just Psalm 149, verse 6, I, I think is just kind of neat, you know, how the Israelites are talking about this, uh, how happy they are dancing around, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, sing a new song, beating tambourines and dancing around. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Oh, the Lord, we're so exult. Let his faithful exult in glory. Sing for joy on their couches. And then listen to this. Let the praises of God be in their throats and a two-edged sword in their hands to wreak vengeance on the nations. Ouch. Dang, go. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. We're talking about swords. Uh, such bear, such a striking contrast with the rest of that psalm. You know, let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to wreak vengeance on the nations. Ouch. Dad, gum, I guarantee that's removed from the mass uh, readings wherever Psalm 149 is used. I seriously doubt they're going to put verse that second half of verse 6. Uh, now, so Micah... Yeah, Micah 7, 6, there's something here that's interesting that sounds an awful lot like what our Lord's saying. Micah 7, 6 says, uh, For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men are the men of his own household, of his own house. Um, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the Lord, the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Uh, so what's interesting is when our Lord is saying this about, you know, being, you know, all this terrible stuff about family contention and uh, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and the rest of it. Um, wow, it sounds an awful lot. Go back and read Micah 7, 6. And while you're at it, read Exodus 32, 26 to 29. And, uh, I'll give you another one you can look up. Deuteronomy 33, 8 to 10, uh, in the context of all this. So our Lord uh, teaching this. Yeah, there's an Old Testament. Uh, there's some Old Testament texts that are really interesting to read alongside. So, of course, when we talk about swords, you can think about Hebrews 4.12. Uh, and the sword that our Lord is referring to ultimately is the word of God. That's my point. Not to wreak vengeance on the nations. Christians are not to go around. He, he, to, he who takes up the sword dies by the sword. Put that thing away, he tells Peter. Okay? Uh, no, no, no. It's not about that. The sword is the word of God. That's what's been revealed to us. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and marrow of joints and marrow, of soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And the word of God is the sword of the spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, when St. Paul talks about the full armor, taking up the full armor of God, what is the one offensive weapon? The word of God which he says is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, verse 17, Ephesians 6, 17. So, yeah, the people, last little thing, uh, tidbit I want to throw in there is, you know, I mean, think about it. When you look at Exodus, you know, how did they ordain themselves, the Levitical priests? By taking up a sword and killing even their own friends, brothers, sisters, they killed all these people, all right, they killed 3,000 people in Exodus chapter 32. And in doing so, they ordained themselves. Isn't that pretty messed up? All right, these guys ordained themselves with a sword. Well, very interesting. Our Lord saying we ought to take up this sword. Uh, but this is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's exactly what they wield, what Peter takes up. He throws away that stupid sword in the garden. Okay, when he cut so-and-so Malchus's ear off and did a botch of that job anyway, he takes up the sword of the Spirit and preaches his first sermon in the Acts of the Apostles at Pentecost. Okay, in Acts chapter 2 here, he throws the heat, boy, 
and preaches this amazing sermon. And what are the people's, what happens to the people? In verse 37, it says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, pierced. Literally is the word nuso. Um, very interesting. Kata nuso. Kata nuso. They were pierced. And, um, yeah, so anyway, um, Yeah, I think it's the very same word used when our Lord was pierced in, the, in his side, but I'm not sure. Nuso, kata nuso. Anyway, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, these people that heard this first sermon by Peter on Pentecost. And then what happens? They, they, uh, they say, what shall we do? What shall we do? Brethren, what shall we do? The people cry out to the apostles. Brethren, what shall we do? Tell them, repent and be baptized. And, and then... Uh, those who received his word were baptized and there were added today to them that day about 3,000 souls. No coincidence there. Because how many did the Levites kill by the sword in Exodus 32? 3,000 with a sword. But how many are slain here, cut to the heart, so to speak, with the sword of the Spirit, the word of God? 3,000 awesome that's the sword our lord wants us to take up and there is going to be division when we take up that sword uh hebrews 4 12 okay it's going to discern between the thoughts and intentions of the heart it's sharper than any two-edged sword forget joints and marrow it's able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart it's able to get between body and spirit okay this is a sharp sharp sword our lord wants us to take up and he wants us to take up our cross. And I think I'm going to just end on that because we are out of time, folks. But this has been fun. Hope you've enjoyed it. And we'll hit chapter 11 next time. God bless you.